Gang, well, yesterday was our postal food drive, not only ours, but uh, throughout all of Broward and Dade County, and we are uh, the beneficiaries of that. Matter of fact, we received food from several post offices, and we had folks working all the way, I believe, till 9.30 last night unloading trucks. I want to recognize them. If you participated in yesterday's postal food drive, would you stand all over the auditorium? I think we had about 30 or 40 people that were involved uh, in working in our postal food drive. Thank you so much for your help. I know that's hard work. Um, I was only there long enough to carry a couple of boxes, get my picture taken, and, uh, and move on. But I think we're able to receive some 45 to 50,000 pounds of non-perishable food, which goes a long way towards us feeding. We feed 100 plus families every single week. And so uh, if you were a part of that, we appreciate it. If you weren't, we'd encourage you to get involved. Um, great ministry that takes place here every single Saturday. And uh, we thank the Lord for Bob. I don't know where Bob Manganelli is. We appreciate Bob and Bob's leadership as he leads that ministry. Well, today is Pentecost Sunday. It's a holiday in the church that, that we as churches rarely celebrate, but it's an important day. It celebrates what took place in Acts chapter 2. And uh, many believe that on the day of Pentecost, which by the way is some 50 days after Easter, it was on that day of Pentecost that many believe that the church was formed. And so some would say that Pentecost is the birthday of the church. And so today we celebrate the birth of the church as we know it, not only manifested in a local assembly like ours, but universally all over the world as people today are meeting together the church of God. But it was also on the day of Pentecost, if you'll remember there in Acts chapter 2, that the early church received the indwelling Holy Spirit. Up to that point, they had not been permanently indwelled with the Holy Spirit. And on that day, the Holy Spirit came and indwelt believers, and they were given spiritual gifts and empowerment to live the spiritual life. And so today, we celebrate that. Things that I think at times we take for granted, do we not? When was the last time that you thank God for the indwelling Holy Spirit of God? who lives in your life, who, uh, who gives you gifts, who empowers you to be victorious. And so today we celebrate that. Would you bow your head with me today and let's just have a word of prayer thanking God for what took place on this day so many years ago and for the fact that today the Holy Spirit of God is still with us. Lord, we love you. You've blessed us with so many blessings. We worship you. Thank you, Lord, for a church family like ours that, that we can come and love one another and support one another and care for one another. Help us never to take that for granted. Help us to realize that the church united is meeting all over South Florida and all around the world today. Thank you for starting the church. And Lord, today we thank you for the indwelling Holy Spirit of God who lives inside of each and every one of us who have trusted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Thank you that he empowers us. Thank you that he gifts us. Thank you that he convicts us. Thank you that he is the down payment of our inheritance, the beginning of everything you desire to give to us. And we pray that even today, that the Holy Spirit of God would speak to our hearts individually, Lord, as we study this passage. Help us not only to understand it, but help us to apply it to our lives. And we promise to give you all the praise, honor, and glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, in just a few moments we're going to read verses 38 through 42. Without a doubt, one of the great blessings, and there are many, but one of the great blessings of living in the United States of America, and once again, our team will be reminded of that. If you've never traveled internationally, it's easy for us to take for granted what we have in our country. Every time I go out of the country and come back, I'm so grateful for the country that we have and all the conveniences that we have. But one of the, one of the great blessings of the United States of America is the fact that every person has certain inherent inerrant rights. As a matter of fact, you'll remember, you do remember, you probably rem memorized it in grade school, the words of the Declaration of Independence that says this, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are 
all endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these, you can finish it, are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I would say that there has never been a country in the world that has fought for and defended the rights of so many. We ought to be proud citizens of the United States of America. Let's be careful though, having said that, let's be careful that we do not confuse patriotism with the gospel. I'm afraid, especially in our evangelical churches in the United States, we've kind of commingled that. They, they are two distinct things, and I am very patriotic. I am a proud citizen of our country. But it's so very important that we do not confuse patriotism and the gospel. Nowhere in the teachings of Jesus or in the presentation of the gospel do we find the exhortation to stand up for our personal privileges, to demand our individual rights. As a matter of fact, when you study the gospel, Jesus often encourages us to do the opposite. Think with me today of the example of Jesus himself. When Jesus came to earth, if anybody could have demanded their rights, it was Jesus. If anybody could have, should have, asked, asked for special privileges, it would have been Jesus Christ. But he never did that. As a matter of fact, in his own words, here's what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 20 and verse 28. Jesus said, the Son of Man came not to be served, but what did he say? He came to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Here's what Jesus is saying. It's not about me. And by the way, if it could have been about anybody, it would have been about Jesus. And it is about Jesus. But Jesus did not demand his rights. The Apostle Paul, speaking of, of the person of Jesus, says this in Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 and 6, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, that word form means the very essence of God. So though Jesus himself possessed the very essence of God, he did not count equality with God as something to be grasped. He didn't walk around with a great big sign on his forehead that said what? I'm God. Make sure you treat me right. All right? That's not the way Jesus responded. As a matter of fact, people didn't know he was God. When he was God, he demonstrated what? Humility. He was always thinking about others instead of himself. That's the truth that Jesus fleshes out in the verses that we are studying this morning. And so notice with me, Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 38, Jesus says this, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. How many of you have heard that before? Most of us probably. You've heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you. Remember, remember throughout the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is taking these, these Old Testament traditions. You have heard that it was said, and Jesus is what? He is raising the bar. He's kind of flipping life as we know it upside down, and he's teaching us a different way to live. So Jesus said, you've heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, what does he say? Give him the other also. If anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you, and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. Admittedly, these are some of the most difficult verses in the New Testament. Not difficult to understand because they're written in a way I think all of us understand. But some of the most difficult verses to apply in the New Testament. After all, who wants to be smacked in the face? Not once, but twice. Who wants to give up their most prized possession? 
Who wants to walk twice the distance, more than you are demanded? Who wants to give up, to willingly give to someone else what you and I have worked so hard to earn? Let me say this. If you struggle with these verses today, you're not in the minority. All of us struggle with these verses. And yet it's so very important that we understand what Jesus is saying, but not only that we understand what Jesus is saying, but that we apply it to our lives because in situations like this is when you and I have the privilege to live out the truth of the gospel. Not only say the gospel, but to live out the truth of the gospel. So I want us to see two things today. Very simply, if you have your outline, the teaching of the Old Testament, and then we'll take the teaching of Jesus and we'll flesh it out today. Notice, first of all, the teaching of the Old Testament that's found in verse 38. Jesus said, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Jesus is quoting Exodus chapter 21, verses 23 through 25. And Jesus only takes a part of it. Let me quote the whole thing. Here's what Jesus says, but, or, or, or what the Old Testament law said. But if there is harm, then you shall pay life for life. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. All right, you're familiar with that. All right, this verse reflects the principle, if you know anything about history, this verse reflects the principle of lex talionis, all right, a Latin phrase. Um, You probably heard this, tit for tat. Have you heard that? Tit for tat. Or maybe if you're used to legal terms, quid pro quo. <laughs> All right? Three phrases that mean the exact same thing. This principle was first found, not in the book of Exodus, but this principle was actually found in, in, in secular literature. It was first found in the Code of Hammurabi, who was a Babylonian king who lived 100 years before Moses. Here's what the principle of lex talionis, tit for tat, quid pro quo means. It means this, the principle required that the punishment exactly match the crime. That's what the Old Testament law said. The punishment perfectly fit, should fit the crime that was committed. So on a practical basis in the Old Testament law, here's what happens. If you plucked out someone's eye, guess what happened to you? Your eye was plucked out. If because of your negligence, someone's hand was cut off, guess what happened to you? You lost your hand. If, If because of you, someone was burned, Guess what happened to you? Lex talionis, tit for tat, quid pro quo. This principle demanded that that the uh, that the um, uh, the person who does the act receives the exact same thing that the victim received. Let me say this: this law had two purposes. All right, the first purpose is this: it curtailed further crime. You can understand that, and as, as throughout history, as, as government and as laws were being established, and as control was trying to be established in society, it was so important that there were laws in place that would impede what? That would impede further crime. And the reason this law was put in the Old Testament was to impede further crime. Deuteronomy chapter 19, verses 19 and 20 say this, Then you shall do to him as he has meant to do to his brother. So you shall purge the evil from your midst. And notice this. And the rest shall hear and fear and shall never again commit such evil among you. In other words, the Old Testament law was saying this. You know what? We're not going to let crimes or people get away with crimes. Crimes must be punished. And so this principle, this law was established to curtail further crime. But it was also established for a second reason. It was established to prevent excessive punishment. And so in other words, if if you plucked out my eye, well, I'm coming after you and I'm going to pluck out both of your eyes. All right? Or if you, uh, you know, caused me to, you know, lose a finger, guess what? 
I'm causing you to lose all of your fingers, all right? I'm not only going to give back to you what you did to me, but I'm going to give back more to you than you do to me. A little bit of human nature, is it not? When someone offends us, what do we want? We want to get revenge. We want to take vengeance out on that person. We want, to, we want them to feel what we have feel, what we felt. Well, the purpose for this law was to make sure that the punishment did not exceed the crime. We actually find, find that, that that took place in Genesis chapter 4. In Genesis chapter 4, one of the early descendants of Adam, uh, Lamech, killed a person. In Genesis 4.23, Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zilli, hear my voice, you wives of Lamech. Listen to what I say. I have killed a man for my wounding. I have killed a young man for striking me. Here's what took place. Lamech was wounded. He was attacked. He was struck. His response was not just to strike the person back. How did he respond? He killed the individual. And so he responded with what? With excessive force. His response was disproportionate to the crime. That's exactly what the Old Testament law wanted to avoid. So here's what Jesus says within the law. It was already established to curtail crime, to prevent excessive punishment. It was already established eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. All of that has been established in the Old Testament law. But as we've seen throughout the study, the Jewish leaders took what God had put in his word and they perverted this teaching into a personal license for revenge. And so they'd taken God's, God's plan for civil justice, for, for civil authority, all right, for, 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 for control within the society, and they took that and they perverted it into something as a personal license, a personal vendetta for revenge. In their eyes, here's what happened. In their eyes, each man was permitted to become his own judge, jury, and executioner. And so what if somebody did something to me, then according to this, I had the right to what? Exact revenge. As I was reading through this, I kind of thought of, I don't know whether anybody likes cowboy movies. I love cowboy movies. All right, and so this person is somewhat convicted by a rogue band of men, and they say, we got to wait for the judge. We're not waiting for the judge. Let's lynch him right here. Did you ever, did you ever, did you ever watch a cowboy movie that said that? All right, y'all going to want to go home and watch a good cowboy movie today, right? And so sometimes, if we're not careful, we respond that way. Listen, I don't need anybody to verify what's taking place. I know what happened. Let's lynch the person right here. That's what the Pharisees were guilty of. And so they became their own judge, jury, and executioner. If they saw an injustice was done, they felt like it was their responsibility to take out vengeance and to retaliate. God's law was turned into an individual license for personal vengeance. Here's what I want you to see, and then we'll move on. What God gave as a restriction to civil courts, and by the way, you look at every time this is mentioned in the Old Testament, it was never given to individuals. It was given to civil courts to carry out justice. What God gave as a, re as a restriction to civil courts, they had turned into permission to exact revenge. Or an individual. They took what the Old Testament taught and they perverted it to something that was convenient for themselves. And so we find the Old Testament teaching. Jesus said he's telling this group who had misinterpreted Scripture, misapplied Scripture, and he said, okay, you've heard what the Old Testament says, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. So how would Jesus respond to their misinterpretation of the passage? How would Jesus teach these verses? Well, the second thing in your outline is this, the teaching of Jesus. 
In verses 39 through 42, Jesus responds to their incorrect misinterpretation or their incorrect interpretation of Scripture. So here Jesus rebuts the Pharisees' misinterpretation. And Jesus says this, the very first thing he says is this, do not resist the one who is evil. Let me pause for a second because this passage has been used, in my humble opinion, erroneously through the years. And there have been individuals that have used this passage of Scripture as an exhortation for passivism, as an exhortation for saying, you know what, you know, no government should be involved in war, you know, all of those things. Those who are in the anti-war movements use this verse as a defense for that, and some would even say, you know what, don't even defend yourself. If someone attacks you, you sit back, God's the judge, and you allow them to do it. I do not believe that's what this verse is talking about. I do not believe that this verse is saying that you and I cannot defend ourselves. You and I cannot defend our families. Here's what Jesus is saying. We find here an admonition against retaliation. We don't find an admonition against defending ourselves. We find an admonition against retaliation retaliation. So here's what Jesus says once again, but I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. Here's the way that I flesh that out. It's in your notes. It's this, as followers of Jesus Christ, we should never pay back evil for evil. Let me say that again, so practical. As followers of Jesus Christ, we should never pay back evil for for evil. Yeah, but Brian, boy, that person did something to me, so you know what? I'm going to do something to them. That person spoke badly of me, so I'm going to speak badly to them. That person ripped me off, so you know what? I'm going to rip them off. Jesus is saying, no, 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 wait a second. It's not our responsibility to retaliate. We should never pay back evil for evil. Let me show you three verses that are in Romans chapter 12. Uh, three verses in which the Apostle Paul takes this exact topic and he fleshes his out, it out just a little more. Romans chapter 12 and verse 17. Notice what Paul says. Repay no one evil for evil. You back and say, yeah, but Brian, you don't know how wicked that person is. Notice what Paul says. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to what is honorable in the sight of all. Verse 19, two verses later. Beloved, never avenge yourself. All right, now, I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed, and I'm not the smartest guy that ever lived, but I think I understand what the word never means. What does the word never mean? Never. Here's what Jesus says. Beloved, never avenge yourself. But leave it to whom? Leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written... Vengeance is mine. I will repay, say the Lord. By the way, that comes from Deuteronomy chapter 32 and verse 35, if you want to write it down. Paul is saying, listen, it's not our job to avenge ourselves. We entrust that. We trust that into the hand of an almighty God who is just, who is perfect in his ways. Romans chapter 12 and verse 21, Paul says this, do not be overcome by evil, But I love this phrase, overcome evil with what? Good. We overcome an unkind word with what? A kind word. We overcome anger with what? With love. We overcome an abusive spirit with a compassionate heart. Jesus is saying, as followers of him, we should respond differently. Second thing that I wrote in my notes is this. As followers of Jesus, we are called to deny our personal rights for the sake of the gospel. As followers of Jesus Christ, we are called to deny our personal rights for the sake of the gospel. After I wrote that phrase, I get it. Here's here's the very next thing I wrote in my notes after that phrase. I wrote, oh man, is that hard. It's not easy, is it not? 
Here Jesus outlines, in the preceding verses, Jesus outlines four aspects of our lives in which we are called as followers of his to deny our personal rights. Here he speaks of, and this isn't in your outline, you can put this to the side, he speaks of our dignity, he speaks of our security, he speaks of our liberty, and he speaks of our property. In each of the four illustrations he gives, the first one talks about our dignity. We'll see it in a moment. The second one talks about our security. The third one talks about our liberty. And the fourth one talks about our property. In each of these cases, here's what Jesus says. The message of the gospel The importance of the gospel, the importance of being a follower of Jesus Christ trumps our own individual liberties. It trumps the right to take out vengeance. It trumps the right to give back to that person what they have given to us. It trumps our human right to respond with evil when evil has been given to us. That's what Jesus is talking about in these verses. Notice verse 39. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. First illustration. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the others also. Among the Jews, a slap or other striking to the face was, the mo- or was one of the most demeaning and condescending acts. To to a Jewish individual, it would have been much better for them to have been whipped over the back, even with a cat of nine tails, as it were, than to be slapped in the face. Because to be slapped in the face was the ultimate insult. As I mentioned, some have used this verse, Mahatma Gandhi and others, who were great individuals, but, but, but they used this verse to promote a meek passivism. But Jesus is not talking about not defending yourself. You say, Brian, what does Jesus mean then when he says, man, you get hit on one side, turn the other also. Does it mean I'm supposed to lay down like a patsy and just let somebody pummel me? Is that what Jesus is talking about? No. Notice in your notes, to turn the other cheek means to not retaliate. It means to not seek vengeance. It means that when someone does me wrong, when someone abuses me, when someone robs from me, when someone treats me in a way that I do not deserve to be treated, I do not retaliate to that person. I certainly do not seek vengeance. By the way, I think it's really interesting that here Jesus is not asking us to do something that he himself did not do. He's not asking us to practice something that he did not practice. Notice the words of Peter in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 21 through 23. Here's what Peter said. For this you have been called. For Christ suffered for you. Notice this. If you, if you look that up in your Bible, it's a great word to underline. Leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. An example is what? Someone that we should emulate or emulate. Someone who we should pattern our lives after. So Peter's saying, hey, here's a great example to follow. Jesus Christ, verse 22. He committed no sin. Neither was deceit found in his mouth. We get that. He was perfect. He never sinned. But notice verse 23. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but he continued entrusting himself to the one who judges justly. Here's what Peter is visualizing. Here's Jesus, the incarnate Son of God, the creator of the universe, the creator of everyone, hung on a cruel cross, And here are these little minions, these little peons that he had created, his creation, that are hurling insults at him, as if they were better than him, despising him, blaspheming him. When they reviled him, what did Jesus do? Nothing. He didn't revile in return. When when they threatened him, he did not threaten back. I know I've said this before. (laughs) 
If I was Jesus, I would have responded so differently. I mean, I would have looked down at those individuals with a little bit of a smirk on my face and said, your day is coming. I will see you in hell. That's what I would have done. Or probably I would have got down off the cross if I was Jesus. Or maybe just while I was up there, I mean, just thought a thought, blinked, nodded, boop, they're gone. All right? <laughs> what happened to all of my accusers? They're gone. That's what I would have done. Is that what Jesus did? No. What did Jesus do? He turned the other cheek. They put a crown of thorns on his head. He didn't protest. He didn't fight back. They beat him with a cat of nine tails. 30 Nine times, the legal limits, they hit him. They nailed his hands and his feet to a cross. Never one time did Jesus retaliate. Never one time did Jesus threaten them. If anyone could have, it would have been Jesus. But he what? He turned the other cheek. And his, his response to them, about them, very simply was this. Father, forgive them. They do not know what they are doing. Jesus doesn't ask us to do something that he himself does not do. To turn the other cheek means to not retaliate, to not seek vengeance, to trust that there is a sovereign God who is watching everything that takes place and that he himself will rise up those who deserve to be blessed and he himself will judge those who deserve to be judged. Jesus gives a second example in which he talks not only about our dignity, but he talks about our security. Notice in verse 40, he says this, and if anyone would sue you and take your tunic let him have your coat as well. Sometimes that goes right over our head. Anybody have a tunic in your closet? Right? Anybody brought a cloak this morning? I'm not sure. So we read those verses and we're like, ah, that doesn't apply to me. Here's what, here's what Jesus was saying. The tunic mentioned here was a type of shirt worn as an undergarment. And the coat was an outer garment that also served as a blanket by night. So here Jesus is talking about the fact that you have been taken to court for something that you did, a misunderstanding, something this person has an ought against you, and they take you to court trying to get something from you. Here he's talking about a legitimate claim made by someone who wants to sue you or me. Here's what Jesus said, the attitude of a kingdom citizen, someone whose citizenship is not here, but someone whose citizenship is in heaven. The attitude of a kingdom citizen should be what? To give up even more. To surrender one's outer garments rather than causing offense or rather than causing hard feelings. So here's what's going on. The person is suing for your tunic, and you say, hey, you know what? Let me give you my outer garment as well. I wanna make sure at the end of the day that there's nothing between you and me. My, my relationship with you, my testimony with you is more important than my tunic it's more important than my outer garment. And by the way, the most important possession that a person had, or one of the most important possessions, was their cloak. It was their coat. I'm not giving up something that was no value to me. I am giving up to that person something that is extremely valuable to me. Here's why. Because with the gospel, that person is more important than my cloak. That person is more important than my tunic. And the message of the gospel is the most important thing. Paul says it in stronger terms. Let me show you Paul's words in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 7. Paul says this, To have lawsuits at all with one another 
is already a defeat to you. And you thought that our society was the first litigious society, right? It was the first time in which, you know, lawyers were running to the scene of the crime, you know, trying to get people to sue one another. It was taking place in the church of Corinth. And Paul said, to have a lawsuit between brothers in the church, why, you're already defeated. Notice what Paul says. Why not rather suffer wrong? Why not allow someone to defraud you? Why not allow someone to even take advantage of you? Hey, tough words. Here's what Jesus is saying. The gospel is more important than our pride. The gospel is more important than proving whether I'm right and I'm wrong. My relationship with a brother or sister is far more important than any of those things. And so as a result, I'm willing to what? Take my coat. Don't just take my tunic. Take my coat also. What can I do? Tell me what I can do to make my relationship with you right. The gospel is worth it. He gives a third illustration. It's found in verse 41. He says, if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Here's what was taking place. Obviously, Jesus was, was living and ministering within the Roman Empire. Uh, you know, the Roman Empire was huge at that time. It encompassed most of Europe all the way down through the Holy Land. And so there were Roman soldiers in the Holy Land. Just about a decade or 10 years before Jesus was born, the Roman Senate had, re- had written a law. Here was the law written by the Roman Senate. In any conquered province within the Roman Empire, soldiers may compel able-bodied men to bear their burden one mile. And so in other words, the the Roman government gave soldiers the privilege to grab any citizen at any time and make them carry their gear. And they could carry it a mile. Now, a Roman mile was just a little bit shorter than our mile today. And by the way, back then, the Roman roads were clearly marked. They had street signs, much like our do today. Most of the signs even pointed towards what direction Rome was, and it showed how far from that point to Rome. You ever heard the saying, all roads lead to Rome? Well, that comes because of the road system that was there. And so this Roman soldier could grab you at any point and say, hey, Tim, I want you to take my pack and I want you to carry it a mile, and I'm going that direction. And Tim might say, but sir, I'm heading in that direction, and and I'm late for work. The soldier could compel him. Say, I'm sorry, you're taking my pack a mile in that direction. The, The law was designed to relieve the soldier. Now, can you imagine how well that law went over with the general public? (laughs) Could you imagine? I'm sure it happened all the time. I mean, I mean, you're inconvenienced by the soldier, and he's making you carry his pack, which was heavy, by the way, a mile, many times in the opposite direction that you were going, and you had to do that. So here's what Jesus says. When someone forces you against your will to go one mile, how should you respond? We should willingly go two miles. You ever heard the saying, go the extra mile? That's what this is talking about. Jesus is saying, you know what? We need to be willing to even inconvenience ourselves, as it were, for the sake of others. Paul said it this way in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 19, for though I am free from all men, I have made myself a servant to everyone, so that I might win more of them. Uh, one, one author I read this week said this, the church is filled with one-mile Christians, but there are very few two-mile Christians today. He characterized it this way, to love your neighbor is the first mile. To love your enemy is the second mile. To bless those who bless you is the first mile. To bless those who curse you is the second mile. To do good to those who do good to you is the first mile. To do good to those who hate you is the second mile. To pray for those who pray for you is the first mile. To pray for those 
who despitefully use you is the second mile. Here's what Jesus said. If anyone asks you to go a mile, go ahead and go two for the benefit of that person. He mentions a fourth, a fourth topic. In verse 42, he says, give to those who beg from you and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. Here's what Jesus is saying. To give to those who ask mean to use your personal possessions for the benefit of others. Anybody agree this is hard stuff? It's so easy for us to walk away with an exhortation like this and say, ah, you know what, that's just kind of over the top. (laughs) That's over the top Christianity. He doesn't really expect us to do that. Really? (laughs) If that's the case, why don't we just rip that page out of our Bible and throw it away and say it doesn't apply to us. By the way, here's the way the Apostle John took this last thing in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 17. He says this, but if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does the love or how does God's love abide in him? In other words, here's what Jesus is saying. Here's what John is saying. Because of the gospel, we take what God has blessed us with and we use it to meet the needs of others. It's not about us, it's about others. I know this is is difficult teaching. Here's my walk away point. Please allow this to sink into your heart today. My walk away point is this. Living out the truths of the gospel is more important than my own personal rights and liberties. Can I say that again? Living out the truth of the gospel is more important than my own rights and liberties. But you say, Brian, that kind of clashes with what we believe here in the United States of America. Remember I talked about let's not confuse patriotism with the gospel. We have been, and by the way, as followers of Jesus Christ, we have a higher citizenship than to the country in which we live. We are citizens of heaven. We, We are citizens of the kingdom. Our king is Jesus Christ. And we have been called to follow his example, and to live out the truth of the gospel. Can can I just ask you some what ifs today? What if we left here today and we decided that we were going to live out these principles at the workplace? And when someone spoke badly of us, instead of us responding negatively as we're prone to do, we took it. And we loved that person. What if, you know, that that neighbor who aggravates the living daylights out of us, you have one of those neighbors? Don't raise your hand. Your neighbor might be sitting beside you or across the church, all right? You have one of those neighbors that aggravates the living daylights out of you. Their music is always too loud. They're cutting their grass at six o'clock on Saturday morning. They park in front of your driveway when they have a party. You know who I'm talking about, all right? We all have them in our neighborhoods. What if instead of losing our temper, what if we loved that person to Jesus? What if we sat back and said, the most important thing that I possess is not my car, it's not my boat, it's not this, or it's not that. The most important thing that I possess is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I am going to live like Jesus. 
I'm gonna give people the benefit of the doubt. I have no idea what they're going through. You know, when they, when they cut me off and, and, and I'm terrible, you know, Vicki can tell you when I'm driving, I'm a different person. I take my pastoral title and lay it to the side. You know, someone will cut in front of us and all of a sudden I, I hit the accelerator and all Vicki has to say is this, don't do it, Brian. And, and she, she knows, because here's what I want to do. I want to pull right up beside them, and I want to look at them, all right? I just want them to know that I know what they did, and I don't appreciate it, right? Are, are you that way, all right? Vicky's like, don't do it, Brian, all right? And, and here's what I'm always afraid of. I'm going to do that, and it's going to be one of you. And then like, oh, my word. I just lost my testimony with one of our church members. Our challenge should be this, to be like Jesus. To be like Jesus. I'm convinced if we were more like Jesus, people would be more receptive to hearing about Jesus. But because we're not more like Jesus, they don't wanna hear what we have to say about him. Here's the idea. Jesus is saying, give grace, not justice. Demonstrate grace, not justice. As followers of Jesus Christ, let's freely give out to others what we have so freely received. Aren't you glad that God doesn't treat you like you treat everyone else? I'm glad that God doesn't treat me that way. God is always gracious, always kind, always compassionate, always giving. Let's be like Jesus.